Hi, welcome back. Today I have another Formula 1 kit and it's one of Tamiya's oldest F1 kits. The Brabham BT46 competed in the 1978 Formula 1 World Championship season and this kit was released the year after 1979. So the box art is typical Tamiya, although actually I notice on this one the driver is shown on the box art but it isn't included in the kit. Normally Tamiya's boxes, if they show a driver on the front, you get a driver figure inside, but this is one exception to that. Uh, on the side it's got the contemporary F1 car, so the Tyrrell uh, P34, Lotus and the Wolf, which raced in the 1970s. And then the markings on the side, comparatively few decals for this kit. But the decals do take care of all of the dark blue, there's no uh, painting required for the dark blue. So looking inside the kit, Tamir instructions haven't really changed over the years. Uh, these ones are in Portuguese because I found the kit on eBay. Fairly standard construction procedure for uh, Tamir F1 cars, it starts with the engine. You can tell these are quite old style instructions because they have the photos in the margins of the completed parts. And also when it names the colours, it, it simply gives names, it doesn't give Tamiya XF codes for any of the paints, which is another giveaway that it's an old kit. So I can't read Portuguese, but I do know that the Brabham BT46 competed in the 1978 Formula 1 season, and it actually gave rise to the famous uh, BT46B, which is the fan car. So obviously being over 40 years old, the decals for this kit are very, very yellow. Although actually, not entirely past it. Um, but luckily for me, the eBay seller included a brand new set of uh, decals, or a newer set of decals, uh, straight from Tamiya in the kit. Obviously these look a lot better. So I don't normally like the idea of having the, cut, the solid colour as part of the decals, but because I don't have the sponsor's name separately, I'm going to have to use them. And it includes decals there for the helmet as well, for Nicky Lauda and uh, John Watson. So looking inside the tyres, these are very, very old school tyres. Um, even the writing, the Goodyear writing on the tyres actually raised uh, detail compared to a, a transfer which the, the later kits have. So you can sort of dry brush on there to get the letters to stand out. The rubber's actually held up uh, remarkably well for 40 years. Although there's a massive seam down the middle which needs to be sanded. And then, I haven't seen this in a Tamiya kit before, a bag of chrome plated parts. These are the wheels um, and also the components to make the, uh, the roll cage as well, the roll bar. I just opened this bag, it was actually uh, all completely sealed, fresh from the factory. So fairly standard stuff from Tamiya, one sprue of the engine, this is an Alfa Romeo engine, exhausts, detail level you'd, you'd expect, there's a little bit of flash around the exhausts but nothing to write home about for such an old kit. And then we have the sprue containing the, uh, the main uh, cowling for the vehicle, unusual shape, and then the under tray, the aerodynamic parts and so on. front wing, rear wing, and then this is the um, the front section of the car. So one of the things you can tell from this kit is just how different modern F1 cars are to old F1 cars. There's no carbon fiber monocoque here and the engine just sits in the back of that big red piece. And then one final sprue uh, with the suspension arms, the driver's seat, the brake discs and so on. So construction starts with the engine. This looks a little bit different to a lot of modern um, F1 engines. That's because it's a flat 12 layout rather than a, well, a V12 or a V10 or V8 or V6 in modern F1 cars. So uh, much wider and not as tall as a regular, as a modern F1 engine. The construction is a fairly simple box construction with lots of sort of little details here, there and everywhere on the sides. Again, although this is an old kit, there is a good amount of detail in the engine. And the fits are really good as well. Absolutely no problems here. 
Right, so this is the main um, part of the car where the driver sits. And the engine simply attaches to the back of this piece here, which I'm fitting now. Just plugs in the back there. And the under tray goes underneath. And so this whole component gets painted aluminium. Uh, there's no carbon fibre here in this car. It really makes you think about uh, the safety of F1 drivers and how they were cocooned in these relatively weak uh, aluminium structures. And this is the under tray fitting on the bottom. Those are not um, ejector pin mounts on the bottom, they're just, um, they're, they're actually detailed, they're supposed to be there. It fits fairly good, it's a little bit of a gap or two, but you know, nothing to be too worried about. Okay, so here are the main components of the car. I primed everything in Tamiya uh, white primer, and then I've given a coat of aluminium to the relevant bit, so the engine block, a couple of the radiator components, the inside of the driver's compartment, and I primed the wing components as well. And I've also painted any of the sort of suspension arms black as well. I find that's the easiest way to deal with these kits is to paint all the parts first, sometimes while they're still on the sprue, and then you can do any touch up or any detail work when you get things together. So this is how the car goes together. The driver's seat slots in here, and then this section slots on top, above where the driver's legs would be. And then this big funny shaped cowling section goes over the top of everything. And I think now that there's going to be a slight fit issue with this. This overall cowling doesn't quite fit right at the edges. But hopefully you can sort that out later on. And then there are a few more parts to go into the engine. And the next step for the engine is basically uh, there are six leads that need to go together using this uh, cable which is supplied with the kit. And here you can see the gearbox that slots into the back of the engine quite easily, it's not painted yet of course. And then if we remove the cowling you can see actually these three points on the engine are the only points of contact with the back of the rest of the car. Okay so the instructions called for 80 millimeters of this cable. I actually found later on that a slightly shorter cable uh, is a bit better. Okay, and then this uh, rather dark shot here, sorry about the lighting. This piece here holds the six cables as they're distributed on the two sides of the engine. I've just put some tape there around there now just to keep them together. So these small black components here at the bottom of the engine uh, are the origin for some more cables which connect to the radiators. And the radiators themselves connect to just behind the driver's seat. So there's a little bit of vinyl tube that's supplied in the kit for that purpose. And then just the construction of the cylinders. So the cylinders fit on the side like this but the cables need to run underneath them. Okay, now this is where it gets fiddly. So this needs to glue onto the top of the engine block, and the cables need to come out, and they need to split into two groups of three, which I've, I've done already with the tape. And then from those groups of three, each individual cable needs to come down and glue in individually. So each of those cables now needs to go into its own individual hole using superglue. It's actually easier than it seems. I didn't do a great job on the first side, I left the cables a little bit long, but the second side, I'm quite happy with that. Right, these are the black pieces I mentioned earlier which attach to the engine. Uh, they broke off when I tried to connect the cables to them. So now I'm trying a new tactic of connecting the cables directly to them. So it will obviously attach directly to the back of the engine if I get that piece the right way around. Sometimes with these F1 kits it's good to keep uh, sub-assemblies separately for painting. So this gearbox needs to be painted a different colour to the main engine block so 
it makes sense to um, keep it separate even though the instructions call to actually put it together now. The only thing you have to watch out for is to make sure the joints are clear of paint when you try and glue them. Otherwise you can pick the car up and the, the whole thing literally just falls apart because the glue doesn't bond the paint well. You can see there's a little bit of a gap there in the gearbox seam but it's going to be hidden by the uh, wishbone. So I gave the gearbox a coat of uh, metallic grey then just touched up the details like suspension in flat black. So the brake discs and the um, cooling vanes for them are just a simple two-piece construction with a little poly cap in the middle. So this is the gearbox section and slightly unusually the brake discs actually go um, at the gearbox side of the axle rather than the wheel side of the axle. So they just screw directly on. Losing focus there, sorry about that. So here's a completed gearbox and the suspension components just build up around this now. This is why it's so important to paint all these sub-assemblies separately because there's no way you could get a brush in later to paint the, the aluminium part of the brake discs and the black part to the suspension arms and so on. It just wouldn't work. And then the axles for the rear wheels. And those line up nicely. And simply the suspension arms just clip in. And there we are, the almost finished gearbox assembly. Just a couple more springs and small components to go in. So this would prove to be one of the, the fiddlier parts of the construction. These radiators lay flat and they are um, connected by little vinyl tubes to the connectors on the right hand side there. That was quite well. I had to actually, as you can see the black plastic, I had to carve down the connectors on the parts to go into the cable. They were a little bit too fat otherwise and they didn't quite go in. And it's a good idea as well to also um, pre-bend this vinyl tube especially with it being so old, so I pre-bent it into a kind of S-shape. That's especially important because the connection points to the radiators are quite small and they're quite weak. And if the cable's not already bent, it can put a lot of force on those joints. So this is what I meant earlier by this, uh, quite a tight fit for the radiators and the cables, uh, putting some kind of torque on those radiators connections. I've actually cut the uh, cables slightly shorter than the instructions say to try to reduce that but it's still going to be quite tight. Obviously I'm using super glue for the vinyl to connect it to the car, but because of the, the strength required for the connection, I'm going to also super glue the radiator to the car body as well, just to try and keep that held in place. And in fact, you can see here that the uh, force on the cable was so great that it actually broke off the connection pin from the radiator. So that will need to be connected again later. So here's the engine connecting to the chassis. It only has these three points of connection and given that there's quite a lot of uh, stress on those points, obviously the rear wheels are uh, connected to the engine. I'm going to use super glue again to connect them because I really don't want the car breaking into it at a later date. Hold it in place. And this must be about my fourth or fifth attempt at actually getting these radiators and cables in. That's the side that goes to the engine. And then I'm using super glue to connect the radiator to the car chassis and the other end of the cable to the actual car itself. So hopefully, just trying to apply quite small amount of super glue with a cocktail stick. Hopefully this will bond better than the Tamiya cement without making too much of a mess or indeed sticking my fingers to the car. And then the final connection there. That was a lot of work for a small cable. Here is the construction of the front suspension. I made an obvious mistake here in that I put the under tray on previously 
and that means that I can't glue these rings for the suspension arms onto the floor of the car. In reality, I got away with it because I could just drop them on and hook them on and actually they stayed in place quite, uh, quite well thanks to that Tamiya fit. Small extension to the front of the chassis which holds the front wing. And then springs, which again go in quite nicely. And I think for delicate parts like this, where the connection points are hidden, there's no harm in really just sort of swamping that joint in a little bit of glue. You're never going to see inside the car there, but equally if you close it up and the, and the spring breaks off, you're never going to be able to glue it back in again either. So I'm happy to swamp it a little bit with glue in that, case, in that uh, situation. Okay, so I've managed to get some uh, TSA Detailing Red on the car, um, on the wings and on the main body structure here. Uh, there's a little bit of overspray and a little bit of seeping from the masking, so I need to touch up some of that aluminium. But I think the car is taking shape. And this is the overall cowl as well, looking good in Italian Red. Tamiya's uh, TS spray cans are always really, really good paints, really hard surface, really nice finish. So there are a few some very minor issues with these older Tamiya instructions. Um, you can see here, for example, the um, instrument panel where the steering wheel attaches uh, goes on top of this component, and there are some ridges here to sort of guide it into place. However, if you actually look at the real piece, there are no ridges on that piece. Uh, so the instructions differ from reality a little bit there. It's a minor point, but it's uh, just a, a good example of one of those small things that happens in the older kits. So I'm going to build the rear wing now. It's a typical construction. The horizontal uh, wing plates are sandwiched between the two end plates. I've been a bit bad here in that I haven't actually sanded down as much of the paint as I should have done. Hopefully the connection, the glue will still hold, but I really should have sanded off the paint and the primer as well, back to the bare plastic, try and get these to connect. You always have to be careful of these as well, not to get too much glue on them, because if the glue um, spreads out when you push the components together, it can really mess up your paintwork. Very interesting, very 70s style F1 wing there, really big fat curved surface. So the final part of the front suspension goes on the bottom of this piece here. I'm not really sure what you'd call this. The front wing on the Brabham uh, BT46 is a bit strange. It's a kind of double layered front wing. So this is the bottom layer and it has the radiator in it. And then the big cowl piece that I showed you earlier comes down over the top of this and kind of encases the front wing. So this is what I mean by it encases it. It's got these wide, long curving end plates here. And they just go down over the top of the piece we just made. So strangely, there's one metal piece in the kit and it's this thin arm here which is used to connect the two front wheels and uh, presumably assist with the steering. I'm not quite sure why they went for metal rather than plastic there. Uh, most of the other kits, in fact all the kits I built have plastic steering arms. And with those steering arms and those brake discs in place, this top component with the instrument panel can now go in there. And of course all of those joints need sanding so that the glute makes a, makes a good hold. The red you can see there is actually the red of the plastic, not the red of the paint. So in most cases I've actually gone through to the plastic there. Okay, and I've decided that even though this kit doesn't include a driver, uh, I am going to include one. I've got quite a few of these spare um, Tamiya driver kits there. They're kind of ten a penny to be honest, so I'm going to include one. I haven't decided yet whether I'll do Watson or Louder. So the gear lever needs to fit in place before the seat can go in. So a little bit fiddly. And you can see the green cylinder on the floor there, which is the fire extinguisher as well. And then with the gear stick in place, there's a, the seat is asymmetrical. There's a small groove on the right-hand side, which should just fit r around that gear lever. Obviously a fully manual uh, gearbox in these old F1 cars. There are no seat belts molded onto the seat, but the driver figure I'm going to add has seat belts molded into him, so that's fine. 
And so because of the way that the drive was molded, I had to uh, remove the steering wheel, uh, fit the driver with the steering wheel in his hands to get them in the right position, and then I'll have to refit the steering wheel to the car once the driver's been painted. So the roll cage is one of the chrome pieces and it's got a chrome support as well which goes with the engine. That looks quite nice. It's important to check the alignment on this because the cowling uh, has a hole in the top of it for the roll cage to go through. So it's a good idea to actually just dry once you've glued the roll cage in place before it's set just to push the cowling in place for dry fit. The rear wing just slides on. It looks like it could go, could go on anyway because the mounting point is round, but actually it pushes on far enough that it locks into place with two square edges. And then I've left that area unpainted because the front wing goes on there, or the bottom half of the front wing goes on there rather. Like so. The car is definitely taking shape now. Now, my exhausts have come out quite a strange colour. Uh, I quite like orange and chrome as a mix to make a nice kind of burnt metal uh, kind of colour. Unfortunately, in this case, I've gone a little bit over the top on the orange and I've kind of ended up making a gold colour. What I'm going to do once they're there is just try and uh, tone them down a little bit, perhaps with a little bit of black pigment just to slightly reduce the, the goldness of the exhausts. They actually look slightly worse on camera than they do in real life. In fact, the fit was so tight here, I didn't even need to glue them in, I just placed them in. So you can see there's a few little touch-ups needed, but the car is taking shape. The whole thing's had a TS13 gloss coat, so I'm putting the decals on now. So one of the things I noticed about the decals, both the, uh, the replacement ones that I had and the originals, is a lot of them are oversized. So this rear wing component here, it has excess on the rear, the top, and the, the front sort of slide side here. They're supposed to fold over, I think, but in reality, it's really, really hard to get decals to fold over and stay. So basically, I'm going to apply them, and then I'm hoping that I, once they're set, I can use a really, really sharp razor blade or hobby knife blade and just gently take off the excess without tearing the decal itself. Even this Parmalat decal off for the back, for the rear wing, it's got slightly too much uh, height. I know there's a little ridge in the corner, the top corner of the rear wing it's supposed to go into, but it's still got a little bit of a uh, bit excess. That said, these have gone, on, gone down quite well. I don't like the idea of large coloured areas with decals, but these are actually going down well, and they aren't wrinkling or anything. Uh, once I put them down and put a little bit of uh, Tamiya Extra Strong on them. There are quite a few variations of this car throughout the season, so uh, this Alfa Romeo, for example, has the option of a slightly different stripe, two thin stripes, rather than the big thick stripe in the middle. And again, for a piece like this, I'd much rather just spray paint the, the front wing. But of course, it's, you can't find a paint that matches the decal, so you would have mismatched colours. And again, this decal is actually too big, and what I actually did, I decided actually to remove this and just cut, a, cut it off with a pair of scissors, and I trimmed the next one down before I even put it on, because there's just, there's about one or two mil just excess. Okay, and then the really big decals, the two which were really uh, causing me a little bit of concern, the stripes down the side and the dark blue at the rear. But again, actually the shape is generally really good. It fits really nicely around this curve at the back. And the shape of the, the cowling at the back as well, the decal fits in quite nicely. The only slight issue is the P drops below the, um, the, the second thin dark blue line and therefore drops a little bit off this part of the cowling. Now, I'm not sure if that's actually supposed to be on the lower cowling or not, but obviously the top cowling needs to be removed. I don't really want to cut this decal in two, so I just sort of squidge it up a little bit. And then with pieces like this, I always find it's easier if you do both sides together 
and in fact there's a little V shape that goes in the middle, there's a third deco in the middle there as well um, at the front and I find it's always better to do all of the three together so that you can get everything lined up, um, make sure everything's symmetrical and so on and then just give it a lot of extra strong and just let it settle down on its own. And unfortunately I think the decals weren't as fresh as I thought they were because once they've dried the edges have actually started to curl up a little bit because you can see the white uh, marks on them here on the back of the car and on the rear wing as well uh, which is a shame. I've had to go with a, a very sharp knife and just very gently cut off the worst of the curling but it, it does unfortunately mean that the, the decals are not looking, looking perfect. Right, these tyres are going to need some work. There is a massive, massive seam down the middle of them. Um, they're going to need a lot of sanding, possibly even just a hobby knife blade, just to get rid of the worst of that seam before the sanding. Uh, but I'm confident we can do something with them. And this is the kind of um, like cotton reel style wheels that go inside the tyres. They don't offer a lot of support for the tyres, so I'm not going to put these in. I'm just test fitting them now. I'm not going to put them in until I've actually finished sanding the tyres. But the fit's still pretty good. But that seam is, yeah, it needs to go. So before I show you the final model, I do have quite a few Tamiya F1 cars in the stash. If you'd like to see any of these cars built in a future video, do leave a comment below and tell me which one. And I also have some of the cars uh, more than once. So for example this Lotus uh, 107B, I have the 107B, but I also have an extra kit because I have a set of decals for the 107C which was raced in the 1994 F1 season. Um, and for the Benetton, I've already built it in the, the yellow and green livery but I have a set of decals to convert it hopefully into the B194 from 1994 as well with a few modifications to the base kit. And then finally for the Tyrrell, I haven't built the kit at all yet but I've got the decals for the 1991 season but also for the blue and white version which was the pre-season testing version. So if you want to see any of those kits being built, do leave a comment below. And Tamiya's kits are not the only F1 kits I've got. I've also got these four kits from Fujimi and uh, the two kits at the bottom from Hasegawa as well in uh, 124th scale. I haven't built any kits from Hasegawa yet, so I'm keen to have a go at one of those. So as I say, if you have any preference on which one I should build next, then just tell me in the comments below and hit subscribe so you see future videos. Okay, and now on to the finished model. Right, so thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you'd like to see more F1 model kits being built or any of the model kits being built, then remember to hit subscribe.